Today I'm talking to a person that needs no introduction. I'm talking to a person who has been in the thick of the auto industry for over four decades. I'm talking to a person who has led Mahindra and Mahindra to great heights for 27 years. Yes, I am talking to Dr. Pawan Goenka, the real statesman of the auto industry who has just retired. And Dr. Goenka, or Pawan as I like to call you, firstly, thanks for inviting me to your home. It's great to have you here and good to see you uh, in, a, in a very different environment. Uh, and you have changed my house to a studio. <laughs> Absolutely. But I think what's uh, the point about coming home is uh, you have retired. Normally, we would have met in the office. So meeting in a more relaxed or a, a retired environment. But I'm sure you're not going to be hanging up your boots so soon. But uh, very quickly, you know, the last couple of weeks after you've retired, what, what, uh, what have you done? Have you managed to catch up on things that you couldn't do? Well, uh, yeah, lots of things. First of all, in the very beginning, the first week or so, still wrapping up everything, hundreds of emails, responding to them and getting used to the new life. Um, in a sense, the fact that we had a fairly long transition of over a year um, prepared me for uh, the transition in a good way. And the uh, work from home has also helped because that was a good transition. And I'm not used to picking up a briefcase every morning and going to office in any case. So, so that worked well. But yeah, I'm, I'm getting ready for things that I want to do now post retirement. And uh, so what, 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 for example, uh, give well, us some uh, few things. Uh, I guess the thing that I'm most excited about Hormos uh, is the work that I'm doing on this committee called Scale, uh, which is set up by uh, Mr. Pius Goel, uh, which is looking to see how we can grow manufacturing uh, in many different sectors, 24 sectors we are looking at, including automotive uh, and uh, the reason I'm excited is that the opportunities that we have in India for growing manufacturing is enormous, enormous. And if you're able to put an act together, few disable, disablers that we have, which you have to remove, then I think we can really become a manufacturing nation. So if I can use my 40 years of learning in automotive industry to see how I can give some input and in some way enable uh, growing manufacturing, that'll be the big deal. So that's the thing that I would probably spend most of my time on. But how, how receptive is, uh, you know, the government and officials to the automotive industry? I mean, I'll be honest, the sense one gets is that, you know, it's not been given the priority it should have for, for whatever reasons, whether it's optics, it's still seen as a, a luxury item. Uh, there's so much potential, but you know, there's just uh, no real focus on it. There seems to be even a bit of apathy at times. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes and no. Yeah, Hormuz, if you go back to a decade ago, uh, I think auto industry got tremendous support from the from the government. Uh, if you go back 2008-9, uh, when the excise duties were reduced significantly, when we had the slowdown, at that time uh, there was a, a tremendous focus put on how to really get the auto industry uh, to move forward. Uh, and, and a lot of things happened with the government. Okay? In the last few years, there have been a little bit of uh, thought that auto industry is a sin industry, as I call it. Uh, because of pollution, because of safety and so on and so forth. But I believe with my interaction that I'm having uh, lately that there is a clear understanding in the government, in the people who, uh, who are the decision makers, that economy cannot grow without auto industry growing. And it is true anywhere in the world. If you look at the top seven economies in the world, there are top seven auto markets also. Uh, and, and I think therefore now, if you look at PLI scheme, for example, yeah, that's one right. third that's of their right. location has gone to the auto industry. One right. third. That's a big Quite statement that the government is making. And, uh, and a belief that the export growth can really happen from automotive because the opportunity is tremendous. Uh, the domestic uh, tax revenue can come from automotive. So I think, I think you will see a changed focus on automotive industry now that we have BS6 behind us, now that we have the crash norms behind us. There's nothing to sort of beat on. Right. Uh, and now we'll see the focus to see how this industry can help in growing the economy, employment, investment, R&D, all of these things. But the sense one gets is, you know, the last couple of years, uh, auto industry has had no friends. It's only been dependent finally on the consumer for good. I mean, whether it's the courts, yeah. frankly, some very, very illogical rulings, uh, more which are uh, emotional and, uh, you know, let's say uh, uh, it, it's more uh, like... Uh, populistic uh, kind of decisions or judgments. Uh, government also hasn't really batted too much, you know, accelerating the whole BS6 uh, transition. 
So uh, that's also had its impact. I mean, we are seeing that in BS6 right now. So we've seen so many models go. You've seen in Mahindra also, uh, you've had certain, uh, you know, delays uh, because of BS6, uh, the whole mess with COVID and BS6, which has actually yeah. uh, impacted the volumes as well. So, I mean, it's come at a huge cost. So I, I think data speaks for itself. If you look at uh, more than 10 years ago, a decade, without, uh, previous decade, the industry has grown at about 10, 12 percent. From 10th year to 6th year, only about 5 percent. And the last five years, growth is only 1 percent. Why do you think that is? I think it's because of all the various things that you just talked about. Okay, uh, Constantly increasing prices of the car because of various things that are happening. Uh, the general negative perception that uh, has been created about the industry and that also has hurt. But I still believe that all that is behind us. I truly believe that uh, you will see a renewed thrust on the auto industry. Everybody that I talk to and since I'm working on this committee, I get to interact a little bit more with, uh, with people in the government. Uh, whether it's the Department of Heavy Industries, whether it is MORTH, whether it is Niti Aayog, whether it is uh, uh, Finance Ministry, Commerce Ministry, everybody is clearly acknowledging that auto industry is the engine of growth right. for the economy. Right? So, you know, there's this perception also now globally that yes, India is a big market, whatever, you know, 3 million plus is, uh, is not a small number. But it's not just a number. We are a very high volume, low margin market. Yes. And within that, about one... And if you take two manufacturers, they've got more than, uh, you know, 50 percent of the market. So scale is a big, big issue. Yep. And, you know, when you're pushing for, uh, you know, self-sufficiency, Atman, I mean, you need scale for that. Otherwise, yep. you can't put the investments. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense at yep. all. So do you think scale is one of the big issues which are challenging, uh, cha uh, big challenges? And for that, you really need strong export incentives, which probably the, right. with the PLI you can get. So I think, uh, see, if you look at the scale, there, there, there are two parts to it. One part, like what you say, I agree with you, that given that we are 3 million uh, market and half of it is taken by one player, and the remaining 1.5 million is divided into 15 players, uh, there is very little left for the tail, right? And therefore, the tail cannot survive. That's, that, that's, that's for sure. But nobody wants to quit the market either, except there are one or two casualties uh, lately, but nobody wants to quit the market because the market has the potential. But there is one other point, Hormuz, that I believe in, that somehow India or Indian auto industry has gotten over this scale bit in some sense. Uh, nowhere else in the world can you make good profit on a 50, 60,000 volume on a platform. And is that because of the low cost of development, the intrinsic low it's, cost structure? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's two, three things. One is the low cost of development. Uh, I mean, if you take Scorpio, for example, uh, which is 20 years ago, uh, but uh, given that we developed it at 550 crores, and given that it's still selling 50,000, 60,000 after 20 years, it's a hugely profitable product, obviously, right? And You've nowhere, amortized that investment multiple nowhere, times. No, yeah, nowhere else in the world would you be able to make money, good money, on a 50,000 uh, vehicle platform. So India, so, so one, is the, one is the low cost of investment. Second also is our lower overheads. Uh, if, I, if I was to compare the PNL of Indian auto companies to PNL of Koreans or Europeans, you would find that what the so-called SGNA uh, is very small in India, right? And the fact that labor costs are lower. So when you add it all together, we are able to make uh, money if it's a good product, successful product, at 50, 60,000 volume also. Uh, and uh, there are very few products in India that go beyond 50, 60,000 except for some uh, low-end hatchbacks, right? Right. Uh, and... and, and, uh, and uh, Maruti is profitable, Mahindra is profitable, Honda is profitable, Tata is turning the corner, Toyota is profitable. So, you, you can make, make money at right. a small scale, but very difficult for those who are selling 20, 30, 40,000 total volume. Just coming to that on electric vehicles, power. I mean, to be honest, you all had a pretty good first mover advantage with, uh, with Riva, you all took over Riva. Uh, you all made, you had the e Verito, uh, but somehow, you know, I, I, you've not really been able to accelerate uh, the kind of U, uh, EV development and are a little behind. I mean, to be honest, someone like Tata has come with the Nexon EV sure. and leapfrogged the head of sure. you. I mean, is that one of the disappointments? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes and no. And I'll tell you why I'm saying yes and no. Uh, yes and no is a very easy answer to give always. Uh, see, we had focused primarily on shared mobility and on last mile connectivity. 
because we believed and I still believe that that's where the real uh, game is going to be in India. That's where uh, the three-wheeler focus the, uh, the three-wheeler, the, the atom yeah. that is about to come, the, uh, the EKUV uh, that, that will be coming up. So these are all shared mobility uh, pro products with, uh, uh, with uh, and last mile connectivity and delivery products, which are doing very well and I think we have lion's share of the market. But uh, they are still low, volta low voltage uh, uh, they, are, they are all low voltage. So far we have not launched our volt. first high voltage product. Uh, and and we, were, we had decided that we are going to get into high voltage little later. Okay? That little later will happen soon, uh, maybe a year, year and a half. Uh, and, and we had uh, shown the product uh, S210 in the right. Auto Expo last, last year and that product we are working on and that product will be very similar uh, to, to Nexon in terms of uh, range, power, performance, all of those things. Up until now, even now, if you look at any company in India that has invested uh, most in electric vehicle, it is Mahindra. Right. Uh, uh, I think our total investment probably is still is higher than any other company. Uh, we have invested about 14, 1500 crore already. We are the only ones with full infrastructure uh, for making batteries, motors, uh, power electronics, chargers, uh, full R&D uh, of 250, 300 people just on electronic, electric powertrain, uh, a plant. So, so we, I think, are still uh, furthest ahead. Right. The only difference is that we don't have a personal vehicle. Uh, product, uh, right. the high voltage personal vehicle product and once that comes in, uh, will be, be, will be, be in the race. Right. Yeah. But again, I want to talk on engines. Is that but, but one more thing I want to add that the current announcement as you would have seen of Bon electric vehicle platform, right. uh, something that we had debated for quite some time as to when is the right time to jump in and it's a chicken and egg situation again. And now we had decided, uh, uh, Anish and Rajesh, that it's the right time for us to get into that part, that, that, that space and they're getting into it. I think Bond Electric is the way ahead because using an existing platform, always there are compromises on that. So, but coming to engines, I mean, you know, looking back at your 27 years in Mahindra, are you, are you proudest of that? One <laughs> of the things, because you've been an engine guy, the whole team was engines, you had Rajan, you had Velu, uh, you know, the kind of, let's say the, the engine, the powertrain heroes, which kind yeah. of built uh, a, a powertrain family of both petrol and diesel, which I think are genuinely world class. So uh, I would say that yes, we have an edge on engines. Okay, and you are our biggest proponent in that. Uh, you have always uh, uh, complemented the engines that we have developed. Uh, come to MRV, taken a look at the engines. Uh, I don't think it has happened because my background is engines. Okay. Uh, but you don't think it could be you would give that little bit extra investment to Velu, you it's know, possible. that you understand, okay, let's spend a little bit more here. Uh, I, I, I don't know, but it's it's possible that, that there is unconsciously or subconsciously I have supported engines uh, uh, more, but I have supported vehicles, platforms equally well. Yeah. Uh, now, now, the thing about engines is that when you look at a vehicle platform, you're looking at something that's going to be with you eight years, 10 years, right? Okay, Scorpio is an exception, but normally eight years, 10 years is what you look at. But when you look at an engine platform, it's, it's a generation, years, yeah. it's a whole generation, right? And in fact, even before I came in uh, to Mahindra, you remember our MDI engine, that was the strongest engine in the pickup uh, segment at that time, right? And it still remains uh, in the pickup segment, nobody can touch that engine. And the engines that we launched since then, NEF, the, the NEF, the 2.6, the, right. the, the 1.2, 1.5 liter, and the new uh, Eagle 2, as we call it, or MHOG, that will that has come into Thar and will come into 601 and 501. Uh, these are uh, uh, these are on 101. Uh, these are all very nice engines, and I would admit that uh, uh, I have uh, probably spent a lot of time uh, uh, poring over the details of these engines, uh, uh, but I have done that for vehicles also, uh, and and I guess. Uh, Little bit of my engineer's background. Uh, when I when I go to MRV, in fact, in my in my review calendar, I used to go to MRV uh, for two or three days in a quarter, and I really used to look forward to those two or three days. And I used to forget once I land there that I'm the MD of the company, and roll up my sleeves and become one of the engineers, right. uh, and go over the details that one would never expect or perhaps even want an MD to get into. But I used to love it. I used to enjoy it. Coming back to uh, some of the uh you know, during your tenure, you've overseen some joint venture, joint venture possibilities, frankly, which haven't really worked. I mean, uh, we've had uh, with Renault, it hasn't worked. And with Ford, you were very keen on that. That hasn't worked. Is that a bit of a disappointment for you? And the fact that do you think for some reason, 
Indian companies are just not ready to get married to multinationals. <laughs> um, disappointment in the sense that the outcome that we had expected from the product uh, didn't deliver. So Logan uh, didn't deliver to the expectation and that obviously was a disappointment. That's a different reason, nothing to do with the joint venture per se, a different reason why Logan didn't deliver. Uh, but as far as the joint venture is concerned, there are also intangibles that you're looking for from a joint venture. And there we had not failed at all. Whether it is the Renault joint venture, whether it is the Nevista joint venture, the first four joint venture, uh, none of those things we have, we have had uh, a failure in. Uh, the second round with Ford, uh, which, which didn't, didn't happen, uh, is clearly something that uh, is a bit of a disappointment for me. Uh, the decision that we took was the right decision at the point of time. Uh, given how things have changed with COVID, uh, given how the volumes have come down for the industry overall, uh, given how one has to really uh, be more prudent on how do you allocate your capital and given that we had taken a call to double down on electric vehicle with bond electric vehicle platform, I think the decision had to be taken. Uh, but uh, uh, the reason we had uh, signed up for the joint venture uh, were equally valid. Uh, the, the scale uh, benefit that we were expecting to get where you started off from, uh, the international exposure, uh, the technology exposure. Uh, all of those things would have also worked out. But it's at a point of time where if COVID had not happened, I'm sure that we would have had the Ford joint venture and uh, uh, right. would be currently operational. But, you know, just talking about uh, uh, this, I mean, in a way, the question one would ask is without Ford, what is the way forward? There are certain product gaps. Uh, you've got a 4.2, 4.3 meter gap over there, which uh, you were going to use a Ford platform for that. Is it possible that the 201 platform uh, can be stretched and made into that. You've already invested in powertrain and the ENE architecture. So that's done. You just have to now invest in platforms. Yeah. So uh, is that something you can do alone or will you need, would you think that's the way to, again, maybe look at someone else. I mean, you could look at Ford, you could, I mean, not, not Ford, you could look at Volkswagen, you could look at MG, you could look at uh, so many people. You, you're, you're smiling, so I think uh, I've, so, I've, I've struck some little no, chord so over Hermos, there. Uh, uh, we are not sitting in Mahindra office now, we are sitting at my home. Right. Uh, and it's not appropriate for me to talk about what Rajesh or Anis are planning on doing. Uh, obviously, they are uh, very well aware of uh, the gap there is. They're very well aware of uh, uh, the Ford platform that we would have probably built a product on not being there. And they have their plans. Uh, right. And it just will not be right for me to talk about uh, uh, what they would be doing. Uh, but but uh, that one gap that you had talked about in our offering of, uh, of SUVs, uh, that one gap obviously we have to fill because it's, a it's an fairly, important it's, gap. It's a fairly big, big, big size, uh, big Space. chunk. Uh, right, and I think already announced officially that we will not be getting into the uh, very small SUVs uh, and get into any of the other product. In it. The last one is is Sangyong. Now that wasn't a joint venture; that was an acquisition, which uh, you you know you've got out of. Uh, again, is that a bit of a disappointment? I know it's uh, <coughs> was a really bleeding y'all, yeah. but there were a lot of synergies, intangible synergies, yeah. whether it's uh, interior quality, whether it's uh, sourcing something common like a ice and gearbox, uh, which obviously had that benefit. Now, the scale of that will also go away. So, yeah. uh, is that also, do you think, so, a bit of a, a, a challenge? But I, obviously, Sangyong was really, uh, uh, yeah. you know, a huge financial burden as well. So, let me put it this way, that uh, if you were to ask me, two or three things that I regret the most in my career at Mahindra. One of those will be where Sangyong ended up. Right. Okay. Uh, when we acquired Sangyong, we had all the right reasons to acquire it. If we had to acquire all over again, I'll probably still do it. Uh, but probably maybe manage it somewhat differently. Okay. Uh, what learnings that we have had in the last 10 years. Uh, I believe that uh, the synergy benefit that we had from Sangyong, uh, the technology partnership that we could do with Sangyong, learning Korean way of doing, Korean way of working was also a very big advantage to us. Okay. And in sense, what Mahindra brought to the table and what Sangyong brought to the table uh, was very complementary uh, and, and, and a lot of good things would have happened. Uh, it unfortunate that two, three things happened at the same time. 
and Sangyong ended up where it ended up and we had to again we had no option give because given how concerned everyone was with the covid onset on what will be situation with the with the with the cash flow or with 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 funding uh, we just had to take the decision to not put 300 billion korean won into sangyong uh, but uh, this was sort of an unfortunate outcome of something that could very easily have been a uh, 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 tremendous value to mahindra group right but you know pawan i mean uh, quite honestly these are these are things you can look at in hindsight but net net i mean to see where the company has gone when you took over where the company was when you took over and to where it is now i'm sure a huge sense of satisfaction i mean certain successes scorpio bolero uh, xuv 500 okay you know not had those uh, 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 successes uh, recently but still you've had some great products uh, xuv 300 as well i'm sure there must be a deep sense of satisfaction that you know from a product standpoint you've kind of really raised the bar dramatically yeah so uh, we have talked quite a bit about what didn't work well yeah. uh, but but if i was to look at what worked well uh, clearly there is a, a sense of satisfaction and fulfillment that i have uh, now uh, and i think there are two or three things that uh, i would want to talk about uh, and uh, it's not just about mahindra it's also how the automotive industry in india has has sort of moved in these 25 27 years uh the first one that is the biggest uh, sort of change that has happened in the industry uh, from the time that we were doing bolero and scorpio to now is the whole supplier ecosystem uh i still remember how rudimentary the supplier uh, base was at the time of bolero and scorpio and where we are today and, and today, it was still very vertically integrated then also. that's right and we had to be at that time right and today today our suppliers can rub shoulders with the best in the world uh the second thing that has changed significantly is the uh quality Uh, that we have on a product uh, uh, you will recall uh, how the products were in uh, mid 90s to where i mean nobody will buy even one of those products today uh, if if those products were in the market right uh, so so significant change in the quality tremendous focus put by the oems by suppliers uh, and tremendous pull created by the customers because they rejected poor quality so that's the second one the third one that is the biggest change is in our ability to develop products uh and uh, you know in mid 90s uh, about the only Absolutely. company that could do anything with tata motors right uh and now there are several companies that have full fledged r&d center can do full product development can do design engineering development everything the whole infrastructure is there uh and everybody is coming to india to set up the r&d center in fact i think it's fair to say you you've left the company with a really healthy future product pipeline there's so much on the table uh which uh, uh i'm sure that's going to yeah. help the company uh, you know for the next yeah so so i think but for one or two product that didn't work out well uh we have had a good run absolutely uh, and and uh, those one or two products uh, unfortunately also pulled down our market share uh, in the in the in the uv segment uh but uh, just imagine if kuv had done 6000 uh, uh or if tuv had done 4000 right then we would be in a different uh, different uh, space altogether right so so one or two but 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 um, uh i think that uh, the new product pipeline that you just talked about uh, and the thar being the first one which has already proven uh, that uh, that we have a very yeah. uh, the 601 and z101 and the 601 z101 yeah. uh, both of these products are mainstream products for yeah. us and i'm sure that 4.2 4.3 will come at some point that's a very and that that juicy i cannot i cannot talk much right. about yeah. i cannot talk much about um so 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 i th- i think uh, in terms of the whole infrastructure for product development for manufacturing chakan plant uh, i feel very good about because that's uh, one of the most state of the art plant that india has uh, and it's going to serve mahindra for the next 40 50 years uh, and and that's a good infrastructure to have the the proving ground the testing center that i think you had visited once uh, again uh, something that was very badly needed and the whole mrv the engineers that we have so i feel good about uh, about these things uh, that we have the foundation uh, on which to uh, continue develop winning products right but uh, and you know pavan at the end in a way do you feel you've gone out on a high with something like the thar it's our car of the year and it's just taken the market by storm i'm sure it must be a deep sense of satisfaction that you've kind of ended your innings at mahindra with what is really a groundbreaking product in in every way <coughs> yes and, uh, uh, and clearly uh, i'm sure 
this is just the start of the product pipeline which you've kind of put in place yes. as part of your legacy. Definitely and uh, I would be even on a bigger high if uh, W601 and Z101 Z101 get the same sort of uh, response from the customers. Right, but clearly I think the Thar is showing the way forward, especially on the powertrain side. As you know, as you know, I've, I've been constantly saying, very impressive on that. Uh, yeah. it, it, overall product quality has improved. So really, uh, you know, I think the whole transition from BS6 maybe caught Mahindra a bit flat-footed over there. But I think once over this hump, uh, I think is it something you are really, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure in a year down, you, you are retired, but I'm sure that would give you a deep sense of satisfaction. So I think uh, one uh, thing, Thar was the first product with the new engine right? Uh, and the same engine is going in 601 and uh, 101. So that's a very good uh, sort of sense of uh, comfort and that I'm getting that a new engine <coughs> is working very well because you know when you launch a new brand new engine, brand new platform, there's always a little bit of uh, risk that one is taking but I'm very happy that uh, And engine. second thing that's very important Hermas that uh, for the longest time Everybody was very apprehensive about Mahindra being able to launch successful petrol engine. Exactly, exactly. And and now we have two highly successful petrol that's engines. Right. The, the one that goes into XUV300 and the one that's gone into Thar. Right. Uh, so I mean, it never had a petrol engine no, legacy. I mean, no. you had the Hurricane to be honest. Yeah. You flirted a bit with a Renault petrol which wasn't successful yeah. at all. So that's, I think, must be again a really huge sense of satisfaction that diesel, yes, you've had your roots in that. But to kind of take the petrol market by storm, I'm sure that also must yeah. be something which is of uh, great, uh, great satisfaction to you. Yeah, and I think I think the industry uh, uh, today in India is uh, sitting at a inflection point. Okay, uh, and sort of where we started by you saying that uh, is the government really giving doing justice to the industry? Uh, I think we are at a point where if there is a bit of a hand holding. Uh, of the industry. This industry can grow very rapidly uh, and <clears throat> I'm kind of uh, <clears throat> saying that can we look at doubling the industry in five years? Okay, It may sound very aggressive the double in five years uh, from where we are but we have a low base right now. We haven't grown in the last five years uh, and therefore there is some pent up uh, demand so to say. Uh, I think country will be served very well if the auto industry can grow both domestically and export <clears throat> and can add tremendous value to the economy, it's doable because we have the companies, OEMs, the suppliers, uh, we have the consumer base. Uh, I think we have the affordability also uh, in, in India, uh, but we need to perhaps look at little bit of uh, slowing down on too many new regulations coming in. Right. Uh, some breathing room is required for the industry because we have really been bruised. Exactly. Uh, but uh, does the government realize that? They seem to be very inflexible on that. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, the, because I think meeting BS6 in a record time kind of proves the point that when they say jump, uh, the industry just says how high. You know? yeah. so, um, hard for me to answer that question. Um, is that something you would like to explain to the government that the industry does need breathing time because we have uh, talked about it right. we have talked about it uh, and uh, in fact some of the smaller things the government has put aside um, because <clears throat> see every regulation that is being put in is obviously done with the right intent right but every regulation has a price to pay uh, and and we need to kind of balance out uh, whether the price to pay is more or whether the benefit is more right uh, the the uh, actually if one should really feel very good that the Indian auto industry has caught up with the word in terms of emission norms now. Right. And it has caught up with the word in terms of safety norms. Safety. Right. So now these two big things have happened. Now let's stop here for the time being. And let's see that we streamline everything, let everything come to steady state. Uh, let's sort of catch a breath and, 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 and be ready to, to run again. And, and, and see when you look at export, and uh, you and I had talked about one that why is India not truly really global? <clears throat> I believe that the reason that is, is that we have focused too much as a country on low cost small car. Right. That's there's not no market the for it that, abroad. That's not what the globe wants, right? Right. Uh, if you really want to become a global automotive country, truly global, uh, we have to be doing cutting edge technology in our products. Uh, we have to have the, the latest gizmos that if, if, I, can't, if I want to say it. Uh, and, and 
really make luxury cars that people would want to own and buy at a price uh, lower than what they would pay uh, in, in their home markets, right? Uh, there are some disablements that we have, FTAs for example, high cost of capital, all of these things are well known uh, and, and there is no easy solution to it but uh, I think Government of India is, is uh, very sensitive to it, uh, how much they can do because again they are competing requirements for many different industries, how much they can do I, I, I don't know but uh, they are certainly very well aware of it and uh, I would have to say that I think Indian auto industry should see good times uh, in the next five years, right? Uh, provided, provided there is no sort of uh, uh, external uh, Fact dark also, cloud right. that comes in. Right. Well, Pawan, I think you know we can go on and on chatting. It's been really wonderful. And just absolutely last question: You're looking very relaxed. Uh, uh, you know, none of the stress of op running or uh, being operational in a company. Uh, Let's say once COVID gets over, once the lockdown gets over, what are the things on a personal level you want to catch up on which you've not been able to do for a long time? Well, um, travel was very high on our list. Uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, uh, that's just not happening. Uh, and uh, Mamta and I are waiting for when we can travel. Uh, we want to do some traveling uh, back to meet friends in US, uh, going on cruise uh, tours uh, and spend a lot of time, health permitting. Right now, everything is fine. Uh, so, so that would be that would be a, a personal time a bit. Uh, I think a lot of people know that I love playing bridge. Uh, that also requires travel. Uh, so, I would like to spend more time. And Mamta again supports me a lot in playing bridge because uh, uh, she is not part of it, but she, she, she supports me a lot. Uh, so, so there are there are two or three things that uh, spend more time with the family. Uh, so, I, about one third of my time I want to put in this. Well, Pawan, I think uh, you know I'm I'm sure you'll always keep yourself busy. But uh, you know it's been great talking to you, and uh, uh, really, I think I just like to personally say uh, it's congratulations on you know just a fantastic career, and it's I'm sure at least for me it's a a sense of deep satisfaction that what you have done for the industry, your contribution. I think has just been enormous. That's why we also gave you a Lifetime Achievement Award, which I think was so well deserved and uh, uh, and wish you all the best going forward. So thank you, Harmas. Uh, you have been a friend from the very beginning, from the time that I came into India in 93, 94. Uh, and uh, you know my famous story. I won't repeat that on camera. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, you've been a friend. In fact, you gave us the first award for Scorpio in 2002. That's uh, right. And the last award for Thar in 2021. So yeah, thank you for circle. that and the Lifetime Achievement <laughs> Award just was such an honor and that you have given me and I have learned a lot from you and, and I'm not going away anywhere. Uh, auto industry is my, uh, uh, my life, has been my life and uh, in a different avatar, I'll hope that I can make some contribution to the industry, uh, work uh, with the players, both suppliers and OEMs and try and do whatever I can uh, in, in helping the industry going forward. Right? Well, that's Pawan Goenka in a very frank, from the heart, candid chat on his career, what he plans to do ahead and above all his thoughts on the auto industry. Of course, we at Autocar will be tracking him and talking to him even post retirement because I'm sure the auto industry is something he's not going to get, uh, he's not going to let go of. Pawan, wish you all the best. Thank you, Harmas. Thank you.